Romans chapter 11, verse 33 and 36. Here Paul writes, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable His judgments and His paths are beyond tracing out. For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. Just like the Apostle Paul, may our hearts be filled with the overwhelming, incomprehensible, and wondrous sense of who God is. May it result in a worshipful response by us, even as we do so in song, by us as the body of Christ, as His bride. Let us pray. Father, we thank You that we can gather again so that we may together as a family be in your presence and in spirit and in truth. Praise you through the songs that we sing, through the gifts that we give, through the study of your word so that we may know you more. And may all these, Lord, result in in the glory of your name. May you be honored. For today we celebrate you. We celebrate your goodness. And also, Father, we celebrate the privilege to live these lives in praise to our King. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's lift our voices to God, for truly it is all because of Jesus that we live today. Let's sing. Giver of every breath I breathe, author of all eternity, giver of every perfect thing, to you be the glory, maker of heaven and of earth. No one can comprehend your word. King over all the universe, to you be the glory. And I'm alive. And I'm alive because I'm alive in you. We declare, it's all because of Jesus I'm alive. It's all because the blood. Christ that covers me and raises this dead man's life. It's all because of Jesus I'm alive. See that from the top? Giver of every breath I breathe. Giver of every perfect thing. Let's worship the Lord together. Giver of every breath I breathe, author of all eternity, giver of every perfect thing, to you be the glory. Maker of heaven, maker of heaven and of earth, no one can comprehend your word, king over all the universe, to you be the glory. And I'm alive because I'm alive in you. And it's all because of Jesus I'm alive. It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ that covers me and raises this dead man's life. Because of Jesus, every sunrise, every sunrise sings your grace. The universe cries out your praise. Singing freedom all my days. Now that I'm alive, that again. Every sunrise sings your grace. The universe cries out your praise. Singing freedom all my days. Jesus, I'm alive. 
It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ that covers me and raises this dead man's life. It's all because of Jesus, and it's all because of Jesus I'm alive. It's all because of Jesus. It's all because the blood of Jesus. That covers me and raises this dead man's life. It's all because of Jesus. It's all because of Jesus. It's all because of Jesus. I'm alive. Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering, Lord. Thank you for the lives we live today, for the life you've given us, for the life we can use to worship you, to honor you, our God. Let's sing. One church, one faith, one anthem raised, God and God alone.
you, you and you alone, our great, great God. You are worthy of the highest praise. You are worthy of the highest honor. And we give thanks to you for your amazing love. A love shared to us Heavenly Father, a love, a sacrifice by a compassionate Son. We respond to that love in worship. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond the Father's love for us. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make the wretch His treasure. Should I gain from this re- 
Why should I gain from this war? Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. This I know. worship to you that ought to be our loving response to the finished work on that cross. To the blood that was shed, to the death that was not in vain. For our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ reigns now and forevermore seated at the right hand of the throne of our Father. And each day, bestowing upon us such deep, deep, and great love. May we love you all the more in return. Even as we continue in this time, may we show how much we love you. Let's now prepare to worship through our gifts. Psalm 111, verses 2 to 4, writes, Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are His deeds, are his, and His righteousness endures forever. He has caused His wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. May we now give back to the Lord for His kindness and goodness. For we receive these through His material blessing. As the ushers come, let us pray. Father, we just want to thank You. And in the same way that we can praise You for this time that we gather before your holy presence, sing of your wonderful love. Declare that you are God alone. Thank you that we, at this point, can also honor you by recognizing it is you who provides and sustains us each day. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your hand of blessing. And we thank you that even today, we can also give in support of the mission efforts of your church. Amen. As the offering is being gathered, allow me to introduce to you uh, our uh, testimony giver for today via video. She is one of our very own, one of our missionaries. If you Grab the copy of the Missions Primer last month. You will see her name there. She is a staff member of Bridges International, which is part of Campus Crusade for Christ. It exists to serve and mobilize the international student population in the U.S. and elsewhere abroad. Again, via video from the U.S. where she is now based. Let's watch this and hear from our sister, Pet Francisco. I was disowned by my father when I joined Campus Crusade for Christ 35 years ago. Even though I was disowned by my father, I stepped out in faith and obeyed God. After two and a half years of praying and waiting upon God, my father prayed to receive Christ and invited him into his life as his personal Lord and Savior two days before he passed away on Christmas Day. So as I served God through the years, God has motivated me to pursue what has called me to do and trusted Him for the lives of people that He wanted me to share the gospel with. 
For 35 years, I have seen how God has faithfully proven himself to me as my Abba Father was faithful and responsible for me. And each time that I go out and share my faith with others, I know it's the Holy Spirit who is working in and through the lives of people. Half of my 35 years with Campus Crusade, I was assigned in East Asia, and 10 to 12 years of those years, was I was assigned with Bridges International, working with international students in the U.S. Through the lives of many international students who were seeking truth, meaning, and purpose in life, I continued to see how God was working in the lives of many people around the world. Working with international students gave me a big opportunity to reach the world. As I step out in faith and trusted God for the lives of these international students, I've seen many students responding to the gospel, responding to the love and forgiveness of God. And as I go through another year of ministry with international students, I'm willing to trust God because my Father, our Heavenly Father, doesn't change. He remains faithful and He will continue to be faithful. And I can see a glimpse of what He has said in Revelation 5, 9-10. to He has purchased by His blood people from every tribe, nation, language, and tongue. And He will continue to pursue the lives of many people who are lost. I thank God for the opportunity of sharing His love and forgiveness to the world. Before we read scripture together, we just like to uh, make a special announcement. We've been sharing the, this since the start of the month. We encourage those registered members of GCF who have not yet affirmed their membership to please do so on or before August 31. In this way, first you will be included in the official membership role that will be submitted to the SEC and also as we have been sharing. This allows us to uh, better minister to you. Again, visit the ministry information booth every Saturday. It is open every Saturday, 5 to 8 p.m. or Sunday, 9.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. to affirm your membership. You, of course, only need to do this once. You may also refer to the write-up in the bulletin written by uh, Pastor Lloyd Estrada entitled, Why Affirm Your Church Membership. So we continue our series on the book of Genesis, and we are now on chapter 6. Open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 6 as we read together verse one, verses 1 to 13. Again, that is Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. Let's all stand in reverence to the reading of God's Word. And let us read. When men began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. When the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind, whom I have created, from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. May God bless the reading of his word. You may take your seats.
Good evening, people of God. We welcome you once again to our study in the Word of God in Genesis chapter 6, 1 to 13 that we just read together. And this is about judgment. Now, this passage will be a little more dark than usual. I say dark because the topic is uh, seemingly negative, but I would like you to open your mind to the possibility that even in a seemingly negative topic like the judgment of God, there is light for all of us. Whatever your spirit will need, whatever you came in with, whether you're sure of your salvation, I hope it reminds you that there are people out there who don't have any salvation at all. If you're not certain of how you stand before God, I hope before the night is over, you will settle this with God. Beloved, if your heart is open, the Lord will speak to you tonight, because concerning our topic, there's no scarcity of fear mongers today. You know, people who want others to be agitated and alarmed. I'm not talking about media. Uh, I'm talking about ordinary people like you and I know. You know, people who uh, send you an email or maybe a link or a YouTube video or maybe a Facebook post and asking you, aren't you alarmed by this? You know, like recently there was this uh, eclipse in the U.S. Uh, I already spoke last week about planet and star alignments. Recently in Leyte, people died from the earthquake. And again, people were asking, when is the big one coming? Uh, And then somebody said, what about worldwide terrorism? Uh, You know, the ISIS, uh, it seems they're losing in Iraq, but they're expanding worldwide, including in the Philippines. But husband, do you know there's something more dangerous than ISIS? It's Mrs., so beware. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I just wanted you to wake up. But, beloved, many fail to realize that rather than fear such things like terrorism or eclipses or whatever else, there is one we need to fear, not things, not events, but a person. It's God. It's wiser to reserve our fear to the one who deserves it most. The bottom line of our message tonight is this. If you belong to God, you have nothing to fear. Zero. About judgment, nothing. But if you do not belong to God, He should be your worst fear. If you do not belong to God, you're not certain The worst fear in your life should be God, and one day your worst fear will become your worst nightmare if you wake up on the other side of eternity, because then it will be too late to do anything to undo your situation. Before we proceed, will you please join me in a word of prayer? As usual, I'll be asking you to join me to pray for the country, ourselves, our church, and of course, how we will respond to the Word of God tonight. Let's unite our hearts, beloved, to pray. Lord, we thank you that every worship service, you give us the opportunity to have a short prayer meeting like this. When we invite your people to join us to pray for matters that are of vital importance, we begin, Lord, as always with our country, remembering you commanded us. 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 to 2, to pray for kings and all who are in authority. And Father, that reminds us that whatever our feelings are towards our national leaders, whatever our opinion is about our president in particular, we are to shelve that aside and in obedience to you, pray for him, his salvation, even his blessing, O God. And we specifically pray for wisdom and discernment, Lord, that can only come from you, guidance from you, for our president, Rodrigo Duterte, Father. We pray you will guide him in his policy decisions, his public statements, Lord, and everything else concerning his leadership. Again, we know if you bless him and he succeeds, the country will be blessed along with him. If he fails in his task, the country goes down with him. So be with him, Father. We pray the same way, Lord, for our lawmakers. We pray that you enable them to pass laws that will benefit everybody in society, not just the high and mighty, but all levels in the economic strata that we have. We pray particularly, Lord, that laws will be passed that will give more to those who have less in life, Father. 
we pray that our laws will, will have sympathy for those who have much less privileges than many of us have. And Lord, we pray that you continue to shield and protect a believer in the highest levels of government. Our Chief Justice continue to be with her, Lord, in her battle to preserve her integrity and her reputation, O God. Protect her, Father, even as we pray together. Lord, here in our church, we are reminded to pray for our missionary, Connie Ang. Lord, for reasons known only to you, you did not let her stay long in her country of service, but you, Lord, have somehow allowed her cancer to return. It breaks our heart, Lord, to, to, to learn that she's now battling cancer again after we commissioned her just a, a month ago. But, Lord, you're sovereign. And you know all things. Be with her. Thank you that her testimony is so solid, O oh God. Her heart's desire, Father, is to be a good testimony for you, even in the midst of cancer. Lord, we pray that you give her quality of life. Whatever the family decides about chemotherapy, Lord, may it be the right decision. Lord, whatever the doctors do, whatever the medicines do, may it give her quality of life. That's what we pray for our sister, our missionary, Connie Ang. And Lord, we pray that you will continue to affirm her faith. Thank you that she's preaching to us with her life, O oh God, with her testimony, upholding and encouraging this church. Father, we pray for ourselves tonight as we listen to your Spirit speak to us from the Word. Lord, we thank you that your Word is forever true. It is forever relevant. Tonight, as we look at it, May your Spirit, Lord, be specific in the way He addresses every one of us. May no one who came here tonight leave without the Holy Spirit addressing their spiritual needs. We pray, O oh God, that you will be glorified in our midst tonight as we let your Word speak for itself. We ask all of this, Father, through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. If you belong to God, you have nothing to fear, especially His judgment. But if you do not, He should be your worst fear. I would like you to look at how mankind and Noah fared before the reality who is God. In verses 1 to 4, I would like you to consider several pairs that we'll be comparing tonight, three different pairs. Sometimes they're comparisons, sometimes they're contrast, sometimes they're similarities. But here, in verses 1 to 4, the first pair is the frailty of man and the fall of angels. In verses 1 to 4, you will see first the frailty of man. Why did you say that? Beloved, it's because of the context. Genesis chapter 5 is the context of Genesis chapter 6. What happened here in Genesis chapter 5? It's surprising that it was the godly line of Seth that was presented in Genesis chapter 5. So, Pastor, why do you say frailty then? Because it speaks about a godly line. Where's the frailty? Frailty because by the time you reach Genesis chapter 6, beloved... When you reach this, by the time Noah is born and alive, remember, there was a godly line. It was obliterated. It was gone. H how obliterated was the godly line? Well, somebody, uh, some Bible scholar did some very conservat conservative calculations of how many people there may have been on earth during the time that Noah lived. Uh, his conservative calculations took into account the average lifespan then. If you remember, Adam lived 930 years. Now, if we presume that Eve lived as long or even longer, uh, imagine how many children conservatively may have been born to somebody who lived 930 years. Now, ladies, I know this sounds horrible to you, but 
if a lady is reproductive for hundreds of years, conservatively, she'll have at least a hundred children. Uh, that's a nightmare to keep giving birth a hundred times, but maybe God gave them special strength to bear that because it was a necessity to populate the earth. Now, when you read Genesis 6, there have been more than 10 generations. And why? Because last week we told you that generations here may not have been all the generation. They may have been representative generations and using representative individuals. So there were perhaps at least a hundred million individuals based on those conservative estimates. And out of a hundred million, how many are in our terms today saved? You know how many? Eight. Eight out of a hundred million. Don't even try to compute the percentage. It's 0. 0.000 something percent. Eight out of a hundred million. That's why we said the frailty of man is, is so highlighted here. The godly line mentioned in Genesis 5, supposedly to contrast with the ungodly line of Cain, the godly line of Seth by the time Noah is born, is wiped out. How? Compromise. Intermarriage. Single people. Here's something for you. Singleness is not a burden. It's a blessing. I hope you will never let anyone convince you otherwise. Don't let people call, call you, you know, ikawawa ka naman. It's not true. It is a blessing to be single. It is better to be single than to marry wrong. Why? This is what you see here. Intermarriage, the godly line of Seth married the ungodly line of Cain, and by the time you reach Genesis 6, no more godly line, blotted out, obliterated. How? Compromise, intermarriage. That's why sometimes I know it riles up some of you when I keep saying, you marry in the faith. If you cannot marry in the faith, don't marry at all. Why? You're adding troubles to yourself. Marriage is hard already by itself. If you marry somebody who doesn't agree with your faith in Jesus Christ, it's not just that you'll argue about uh, where do we take the children on Sunday, to that church or my church. That's the smallest part of it. It's you yourself. Will you be able to hold on to your faith? Do you really think she will be be convinced to join you, or will you be convinced to join her, or vice versa? So, beloved, that's what you see here. That's an insight that intermarriage begins with compromise, and compromise will have a tendency to corrupt you eventually, but that's not all. Now, read your Bibles with me in Genesis 6, chapter 6, 1 to 2. It says, when men began to increase in numbers and daughters were born, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and married them. You know what? It's a compliment to all ladies. It means that angels, uh, fallen angels, by the way, uh, they look at uh, our ladies and they say they're beautiful. So there is no ugly lady on earth, okay? But what does it say here? The sons of God. What does it mean? I believe that of three theories of who they are, I believe that these are fallen angels, demonic beings who saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and then in an attempt to destroy the coming of the Messiah, satanic possessed males, human beings, by the way, who were so possessed by demonic beings, they tried to destroy the family in those societies at that time. You see, the other theories are this is the godly line of Seth. I don't think so. Uh, the other theory is these are the kings, the authorities of that time. I don't think so. Because in Job chapter 1, chapter 2, and 38, the term sons of God is used in Hebrew three more times. It always refers to angels. So these are fallen angels who try to destroy the coming of the Messiah. By possessing human males, those human males will marry females and then produce a demon-dominated family. And people ask, why would God wipe out so many people on earth at one time, at least 100 million? Why would He do that? 
You know why he would do that? Because most of the families at that time were probably of this nature. People so demon-possessed, male so demon-possessed, and then they would lead their families in demon worship. This was Satan's attempt to destroy the coming of the Messiah. He was listening, beloved, when God told Adam, the, the seed of the woman, the Messiah, the Redeemer, he knew that meant that God would produce somebody who will someday redeem fallen mankind from their sins. So this was his attempt to destroy that, and Satan would would possess a lot of people through his demons, create demon-dominated families. I don't think we will see that again. Some people said it happened again in Cain, and I don't think so. I don't think God will allow it ever again except one more time in mankind's history or timeline. The only other time God will allow a demon to so take over a human being, they could barely be distinguished, will be when somebody arises to lead the earth. He will attempt to convince earth he's far better than Christ in all aspects. And the one who possesses him this time is Satan himself. He will have all the powers of Satan, even supernatural miracles, all the intelligence of Satan over thousands of years. He'll be called the Antichrist. I believe that's the only other time God will allow demons to take over humans again. And why is that? To destroy the coming of the Messiah or at least attempt it. What do we learn here, beloved? We learn that throughout history, there has been a war. And by the way, you are not passive participants in this war. Not only are you in the middle of it, you are the target of this war. There's a spiritual war. It raged during the time of Noah. It's raging today. And you're not just passive participants. You are the targets of this war. Let us not be so naive to forget that, beloved. And so our response should be in 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. Sometimes we think suffering comes only because of our sin. That's one source, the consequences of our sin. But sometimes we suffer like Job because God allows trials to strengthen us. That's another source. But Satan, beloved, is the third source of sufferings for Christians. That's what 1 Peter 5, 9 is saying. Christian can actually suffer persecution, and other kinds of hard things directly because of the attack of Satan. And I would like you to know our response should not be to fear Satan. We shouldn't fear Satan. Why? Because 1 John 4, 4 tells us, greater is he, Jesus, in you than Satan, than he who is in the world who is Satan. In other words, if you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ last night, and then you get some perhaps demonic disturbances, which is possible, you do not say, I better call Pastor Larry or Elder Mark or Pastor so-and-so to come to my home. No. A new Christian has all the power of Christ in him. You don't need uh, to consider us as special forces, you know. You. A new Christian, you have all the power of Christ in you. The promise of 1 John 4, 4 is for every Christian. All the power of Christ is in every Christian. That's why I love this little poem that says, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. What does it mean? It's a reminder that, beloved, according to Ephesians 6, 10 to 18, you have the full armor of God. When Paul says you put it on, he's not saying you do not have it. He's saying you have it already. Did you know that? When you accepted Christ, the, the whole armor of God was put on you. 
They are all found in Christ. The belt of truth or truthfulness, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and so on. They are with you now, right now. Even as a new Christian, they're with you. And, and it's up to you to use them. I'll give you an example. The helmet of salvation protects our mind. It's the assurance of salvation. Now, Satan could tempt me and say, you really say you're a Christian? Look at you. You know, when the taxi cut you off, that might be your thought. You, you just let loose some words that cannot be put on paper. You call yourself a Christian? The helmet of salvation is to say, sometimes I don't feel like a Christian because I sin. I, I let loose words that shouldn't even be heard from a Christian. But Lord, I am going to ask forgiveness, and I'm going to ask you to control my temper. Beloved, that's one response. That's putting on the helmet. It's already there. It means using it. Or I can say, I know I'm a Christian, but could Satan be right? Could my doubts be right? Am I really a Christian? Because I did that. And so you're refusing to use your helmet. But that's the armor. You do have offensive weapons, beloved, the spirit the sword of the Spirit is the Bible. And the other offensive weapon, by the way, is prayer. Pray in the Spirit according to Ephesians 6, 18, at all times. This morning, after the 8 o'clock service, somebody came to me. And uh, he was somewhat shaken. He just came from a resort. That a company outing there of something, something like that. Allow me not to name the resort, okay? You might not go there or they might sue me. Uh, he said there was a par particular cabin in this resort that he did not know. He did not know. Had a reputation for unusual, unusual things happening. Uh, for some reason, he was there. And to make the story short, he asked me to pray for him after the 8 a.m. service, after the same sermon, because he experienced what he was sure was demonic disturbances. And he said, is that valid? Was I imagining things? I told him, it's valid. It can happen. There could be places where there is a demonic presence. And I said, did you notice? It couldn't touch you, right? It may have scared you, but look at you. You're alive. You're breathing. You're talking to me. It affirms that you are a believer in Christ. He said, yes, pastor, all I did was pray. I prayed for an hour. I thought in mind, good for you. Now you know how powerful prayer is. Beloved, that for me, as I prayed for him, that reminded me of what I just told you. It doesn't matter if you're a new Christian or an old Christian you are never helpless. You're never powerless when it comes to Satan. What you learn here, the frailty of man and the fall of angels, is the reality of the evil one. But if you belong to Christ, you do not have to fear him. You know whom we have to fear. A healthy reverence for God is all that is called for. The frailty of man, the fall of angels. But the second pair that we see here. In verses 5 to 7 and 11 to 13, the second pair is the folly of man and then the fury of God. They are connected to each other. And look at how man is described in verses 5 to 7. The words used to describe man here are exact descriptions of society now. Every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Now, if you like English grammar and, and you're a stickler for English construction, you'll realize uh, uh, Moses, when God made him write this, could have told the Lord, Lord, could I put a period after only evil? You see, Lord, you are overemphasizing it. You see? Only evil, period. But God said, no, add the phrase all the time. Why? To emphasize this is how deeply enslaving sin is. Only evil all the time. All the people on earth had corrupted their ways. You want somebody to give a commentary on this? The best one is, of course, the Lord Jesus himself. Matthew 24, 37 to 
39. If you have your Bibles, you could turn there or you could write this down if you take notes. Jesus commented on this. When in Matthew 24, 37, He said, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. What is Jesus doing? Connecting. Connecting Noah's time to our time. You see, these are the last days, beloved. When Jesus ascended to heaven, the last days began. The last days refer to the time when Jesus could return any time for believers in the event called the rapture, which will be followed by the event called the tribulation, and which will be followed by the literal, visible, physical return of Jesus in His second coming. Those are the last days. These are the last days. And Jesus said, you know what? When Noah was alive, it was business as usual. Written all over the landscape. Business as usual. Eat, drink, go ahead, marry and give into marriage. And then Jesus said, and this is how they were condemned. He said, they knew nothing about what would happen. Did you get that? They knew nothing about what would happen. What does this mean, Pastor? Were they ignorant? They were not ignorant. This is a description of their rejection. If you will go back to verse 3 and 4, there's a, there's a, a timeline there. That is significant. That timeline is 120 years. For many, many years, I thought this was a reference to the average age of human beings during Noah's time. It's not. That's wrong. This is a reference to a decision by God that He would give mankind 120 years of extended forgiveness, extended mercy a chance to repent. What happened during those 120 years? That was the length of time, perhaps, that Noah built his boat. What was he doing? Is that all he was doing? No. According to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, Noah was preaching. So, what was Noah's ministry? Boat building and preaching for 120 years. And how, how successful was he? If somebody preaches to an entire world for 120 years, how many people did he help to redeem? How many? Seven. After 120 years, seven people saved. Some would say that's a spectacular failure. I mean, you build a, a massive boat for 100 years? You... you preach for 120 years and you got seven to show? That, beloved, is what happened with Noah. Business as usual. People saying, 2 Peter 3, 4 to 7, and this is actually Peter's description. They ask, where is this coming he promised? This is a reference now to the end times. The mockers say, since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since creation. But they deliberately forget, Peter said, that long ago by God's word the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water. By these waters also the world of that time was destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Beloved, there's another judgment coming on this earth. It will not be by water anymore. The rainbow is God's promise. The flood will never happen again. It will be fire. The earth will be cleansed by fire. 
when you consider this now, when you consider this reality, this is our reality now. This earth is under judgment. And we're talking not about earth. Let's talk about our circles. Everyone around you who doesn't have your faith in Christ is under judgment. Every single one of them. Every funeral you attend of every friend or classmate or relative you know. Doesn't it pain you when you ask yourself, did I have a chance to speak to the, about the Lord to them and I did not? Doesn't it pain you, beloved, that death is so permanent? And we have two responses to the fact that there's judgment hanging over the heads of people without God. We could despair, you know, Wring your hands. Oh, what will we do about them, Lord? There's nothing I can do. That's a cop out. That is saying there's nothing I can do. That's not true. The other thing is apathy, you know, especially if you've been traumatized. You know, uh, Lord, I, I'm already the butt of jokes in this office. I tried it once, and now every lunchtime, they call me pastora. You know, have you been there? You're the butt of jokes, maybe among your classmates. And so, we defend our hearts, our feelings through apathy. If you don't want it, it's up to you. That's what we think. That's apathy. That's another cup out. Is that the attitude of God? Will you read your Bibles, beloved? It says, the Lord was grieved. His heart was filled with pain. In other words, beloved, God may have judged the earth, but before that happened, it says his heart was broken. It says his heart was filled with pain. God may be a righteous judge, but he is broken in heart by sin. Everyone you know who does not believe in Christ like you do, are living like the people in the days of Noah. Anytime, anytime God's judgment could fall on them. I hope my heart, your heart is broken by what breaks God's heart. When people are condemned apart from Christ, may it break our hearts like it broke God's heart. Yet the same heart that is pained by sin is the same heart that exercises righteous judgment. Here is the other side of God, beloved. I will wipe mankind from the face of the earth. I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. You know what it now says? Here's the other side of God. The God whose heart is broken by sin is also the same God who'll say, if this is your decision, then you will get what you want. And that, beloved, should disturb us. Why should it disturb us? Why should it be something that should worry us? I want you to realize this. I maybe share a little of my heart to you. I've, I've always taught people that, you know, until a person has breath, until his last gasp of breath, he has a chance to come to Jesus Christ. I just discovered it's not always true. It's not always true. Did you realize that? It's not always true that God would give a person a chance to get saved all the way to his last breath. You know why? Your passage is a good example of that. God gave them a timeline. Mankind, from this day you've got 120 years. And when Jesus said, it was business as usual when the flood came, you know what it really means? You know what it means? And this is why it disturbs me. It means people could be in the pink of health. It means people could be at the height of their earning capacity. 
They don't have to be dying of cancer. They could be going to the gym three times a week. They could be buff, you know, muscular and all. And then God perhaps would say, that man, that woman who keeps laughing at my word, his time is over while he is alive. While he is in the pink of health, at the height of his earning capacity, while it is business as usual for him, it disturbed me a little because all along I've always thought that God always gives people a chance to repent until their last breath. Sometimes, beloved, he does not. Sometimes, while you are very healthy and strong and earning and building your kingdom, God would say your time to repent is gone. These words then should remind us, beloved, to consider our own lives. If you are here tonight, just in case you're here, you're not certain of how you stand before God. I would like you to consider that if you come home tonight still uncertain of how you stand before God, it is now your decision. You can, while you're sitting there, you could say, Lord Jesus Christ. I have kept hearing about you, various ways and means, various people throughout my life, but I've never been sure of how I stand. Lord Jesus Christ, the best way I understand, I ask you to forgive me a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, save me. Forgive me. Save me. And from now on, take hold of my life. Because it's now yours. You can use your own words. You don't have to copy what I said. But God will look at your heart, and if he sees faith, if he sees repentance, he'll say, you're mine. From here on, from this night, you're mine. Don't come home tonight if you're still not certain. Because the judgment I've been talking about could be for you. And that reminds us of Luke 23, 40. When one thief, the righteous one, said to the other who would never get saved, don't you fear God since you're under the same sentence? If this brings fear to your heart, may that fear of God drive you to Jesus Christ. If you're a believer in Christ, I hope you feel the urgency. Speak about your faith. What is a little laughter? What is a little mocking compared to the eternal destiny of people around us? I want you to imagine what Noah went through. Just let your imagination run with me. You're building a gigantic boat in your backyard. And for a hundred years, which seems to be the length of time it took him to finish, the length of time he also preached to the whole world that he could reach. Nobody listens to you. In fact, you're probably the, the song of the drunkards. Did, did you see that wacko, Noah? You know, that old man, you know, hiring all these workers, spending all his money, spending all his resources, even the carpenters doing, doing the work for him. They, they find him crazy, wasting all his money on a boat. For what reason? And then make it a hundred years or so. Building a boat that nobody could understand why. What for? Preaching. No one listening to you. And in the end, you could only save your own family. That's Noah. If you're a Christian, I hope it reminds you. Keep preaching righteousness. Keep sharing the gospel. Even if you become the butt of jokes, even if you have nothing but mockery as a reward for it, even if people reject you, share the gospel. Our final, final point here, the final pair that you see, is found in verses 8 to 10. Beloved, it's the favor on Noah and the 
faithfulness of God. Look at verse 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. The word favor here in Hebrew could actually be translated grace. Now, I know our series is grace from the beginning, but this is the first mention of grace in the whole Bible. It must be very significant. So what is grace? Did Noah earn grace? It was, was it because he built a boat and God said, oh, you're a good man. For your good works, I save you. No. Hebrews 11, 7 tells us this. By faith, Noah, when what about things not seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world, and note this, became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Did God save Noah because of good works? No. God saved Noah because of faith. New Testament, Old Testament, we are saved by faith. We're saved by grace. And now that we live in the New Testament age, by faith alone in Christ alone. For Noah, it was simply faith. For us, it's the same. But the sovereign grace of God is always revealed in the preservation of a small remnant. Did you notice that by now? How small? Eight over a hundred million. Very, very small. Are you a numbers person? Do you, are you easily swayed by numbers? You know, you're the kind of person who thinks, uh, this must be right, because there are so many of them. Could, how could they be wrong? You know, in the Bible, it's always the opposite. God's people are always the minority. And you will see that over and over again in the Bible, but beloved, a minority with God is the majority. Since we have a little time, I, if you have your Bibles, could you turn it to 2 Kings chapter 6? Starting at verse 8, uh, there's a little story there that's such a beautiful illustration of what we're trying to say. If you are with God, you could be a minority and still be a majority. Second Kings chapter 6 verse 8 talks about the war between the king of Aram and Israel. So two countries at war. The king of Aram had a far superior army to Israel. And the king of Aram would set ambushes against the king of Israel. For some reason, the king of Israel would always know about these ambushes. And so the king of Aram was enraged, and he summoned his commanders. He said, is there a traitor here? Why does the king of Israel know everything I'm doing? And his commanders said, there is no traitor among us but Elisha, the prophet in Israel. He tells the king of Israel everything. So the king of Aram told his soldiers, Find out where he lives, and then capture him. So they went to Dothan, a small town. They went in the evening. They surrounded it with a huge army. So in the morning, in 2 Kings chapter 6, when the servant of Elisha woke up, he saw the huge army surrounding him and his master's home, and he asked his master, what shall we do? Look at Elisha's response. He said, don't. Be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes. The Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire around Elisha. I am not an expert on angels. I don't even know if there are guardian angels or not. All I know is this, if God wants to protect you, He will send thousands or millions of angels if need be. But beloved, the point is this, one plus God is always the majority. You are never the minority. The world thinks you are. I know you are in your clan. I know you are in the office. I know we are in Metro Manila. I know we are in the world. But minority plus God, majority. That's what you learn from this story. Now look at verse 9. It gives the complete picture of who Noah was. It says he was righteous, what he was inside. 
blameless what he was in relation to others. Walk with God, who he was in relation to God. And this last description puts him in a class with his great-grandpa. You know who his great-grandpa was? Enoch. Enoch. Remember Enoch? Hebrews 11:5. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. For he was commended as one who pleased God. Enoch started a lineage and influence. That would cross over to Methuselah. Methuselah means after him it shall come. Hebrew tradition says Methuselah was kept alive by God. And then when he died, it was the end of the 120 years. The deadline. Tagalog, the palugit. It expired with his death at 969 years. The father of, of, of Noah was Lamech who came from Methuselah. They both showed evidence of faith because this is how Lamech named his son Noah. Noah means comfort, comfort from God. What is my point here? Now this applies to parents, grandparents even. You know, parents, sometimes it tires you to try to infuse spiritual values to your children, doesn't it? I remember uh, a parent telling me a few years ago, Pastor, uh, to bring my teenagers to GCF, I literally have to drag them out of bed and put them in the car. Wala pa ako sa GCF. I haven't arrived at GCF. I'm already unspiritual. Uh, parents, could you relate with me? And I'm glad my, my, my kids are not teenagers anymore because I could really relate with that. But you know what, parents and grandparents, don't tire. Look at what happened to Noah. Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah. You know, the world says it takes a village to raise a child. You know what the Bible says? It takes a lineage to raise a godly child. This is again seen in the life of Timothy. 2 Timothy 1.5, Paul said to Timothy, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Grandparents. I know we're not supposed, you're not supposed to interfere in the raising of your apostles, right? But if you see your children struggling to raise your grandchildren, help them with the spiritual side of it. Look at Lois, grandmother of, of Timothy. I'm sure she influenced Eunice. It's almost possible that it may not have been Paul who, who shared the gospel to Timothy. He may have arrived and found Timothy a new Christian, discipled him. Or maybe he shared the gospel to Timothy, he got saved, but it was the testimony of Lois and Eunice which helped Paul. Grandparents and parents, don't stop. Don't give up. Teaching your children spiritual values. In God's time, it will be worth it. And here's one more thing I'd like us to look at. Let's bring this back to the rest of us. Sometimes, beloved, sometimes you feel like Noah. You look around you and no one is listening to you. You know that our wicked generation is the same generation Noah lived in. Jesus was the one who said that. And when your heart is wearied by the struggle of walking with God in the midst of this generation, don't forget two things. First is Philippians 2, 14 to 15. Paul said, do everything without complaining or arguing. You know why I put this here? Because I was pleasantly surprised to discover that complaining and arguing here does not refer to the way we treat people. It refers to the way we treat God. 
Complaining and arguing here is a reference to rejecting God's will and circumstances. Arguing is criticism directed towards God. In other words, Paul is saying, if you will live a Christian life and never wrestle, complain, criticize, complain against God, he said, you will become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. If I live my life always pointing my finger at God and telling Him, you, you don't know how to run my life. Why would you allow this to me? You're not doing your job. Paul is saying it will come out in the way you live. You will never have a good testimony, Paul is saying. If that's our attitude towards God, to complain and argue with Him, he said, you can never have a blameless testimony, but if you could live a Christian life not complaining against God, it reminds me of Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before men in such a way they'll see your good works. Glorify your Father in heaven. Here's the second application of the favor upon no one, the faithfulness of God. Jesus said, beloved, Mark 8, 38, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory. What does it mean, Pastor? The first thing I want you to know is that a shame of Him is something Jesus will never do to a Christian. You know what it means? It means like this. In my life, as a Christian, especially when I was younger, there were times I was ashamed to speak of Jesus. And, you know, I could have had an opportunity to speak of him. Sometimes a total stranger, and I said, no, it, it's too much work. Or it, it, I will just be mocked and rejected. And, and God would convict me afterward. Did I lose my salvation then? No, I did not. I did not lose my salvation. But God was displeased. I had to ask forgiveness from God. And since those times, beloved, There have been more times that I was willing to share. In fact, I've told you about one time I sat in the plane besides a person of a certain nationality. I I think I was coming from uh, MacArthur's uh, Shepherd's Conference one time, and I tried to share the gospel. You know what the man did? He called the stewardess over and said, can I get another seat in a loud voice? And he left and transferred to another seat, and everyone was looking at me as if I was some weirdo. It comes with pain sometimes. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say, beloved, that if anyone in here tonight will say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a Christian, but I hope that in my office for the next 20 years, no one finds out. It will be uncomfortable. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a Christian. I think so, but I hope for the next 20 years, no one in my clan will find out. You know what Jesus is saying? If you can live a whole life, hiding your relationship with Christ. And this is a warning. He's saying, I never knew you. One day you will be in heaven and the words of Christ about you will be, I never knew you. If it is easy for me to hide my faith, if I could live a whole lifetime as a secret Christian, Jesus is warning us, You might be shocked someday to find out you never were a Christian. A sign of being a Christian is the willingness, beloved, to not be ashamed of Jesus Christ. It will cost you, I know, it will cost you not to deny your faith. It will cost you. But that, beloved, is what marks you as a believer And if I can hide my faith, one day I will be shocked to discover I never belong to Him. It's a warning. Heed this warning, beloved. Ask yourself, will I continue to be always ashamed of Christ? I hope it's a decision 
you could easily make. Now, I want this sermon practical. I'm about to run out of time. But, beloved, could you pull out your bulletins? There is an evangelism training in your bulletins. Uh, it's under ministry opportunities. We have a tie-up with a youth ministry from Australia called Mega Cities. Uh, they've been tying up with us since January. We've been helping them. They've been helping us. This is their help to us. They're offering evangelism training, particularly for youth and young adults. Why? Because most of them are that age. And so this is September to Friday, the whole day. I hope you're free. Now, you say, Pastor, I'm 99 years old. Can I still come? Please come. And tell them, Pastor Larry sent me here, okay? Because this is a good opportunity, but this isn't the only opportunity. Our evangelism ministry has quarterly evangelism training. Beloved, I, I'm just trying to remind you, we're offering ways to, to remove the reasons we do not witness. And this is one of those I know. I don't know how, Pastor. So September 2, 9 to 4, especially if you're youth or young adult in age, please come. Please show up. This is our opportunity to be trained. But let me end with these final thoughts. Remember our bottom line in this message, if you belong to God, you have nothing to fear. But if you don't, God should be your greatest fear. Why? Because every second you live, God's wrath hangs over your head, ready to fall, any second. If you have no relationship with God, you don't even know what time limit God has imposed on your life. When he will say, beyond this time in your life, you will no longer be offered repentance. You've seen that here. The people of Noah's time. I hope you will consider the mercy of God offered through Christ. 1 Timothy 2.5. There is one God, one mediator between God and man. That is Christ Jesus. But if you're a believer, I know most of you are. You probably know life on earth will bombard you with fear. Maybe in your experience, trials have tempted you to look away from God and be filled with fear. This is what 2 Peter chapter 2, 5 and 9 has to say to you. If God did not spare the ancient world when He brought the flood but protected Noah, the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment. Trials may tempt you to be filled with fear, but remember this. The Lord knows how to rescue godly people from trials. Don't let them make you fear the wrong things. Beloved, be assured that God is on your side. The Lord knows how to rescue his own from trials. Let's stand together in a word of prayer. In this prayer, I hope you will also be speaking to the Lord. God laid a message on your heart. I would just give a, a minute. I'll pause in the middle of the prayer for you to pray on your own, to respond to God. And I hope you make a covenant with God today about something in your life. Let us pray. Father, we stand before you as your people. Thank you that people came here tonight to worship you. I pray, Lord, that as we looked at you and how the Word portrayed you, a God of mercy, a God whose heart breaks over men when they sin, a God whose heart is pained. Will you remind us, Father, that the same heart you want in us, a heart that is pained by the thought that men around us every day are facing judgment, a heart that is pained by the reality we don't even know if the timeline in their life to repent has run out. So, Father, 
remind us that if the cost of us being not ashamed of Jesus is some mockery, some laughter, occasionally being the butt of humor in the office or the clan, occasional rejection or even outright persecution, remind us how small these things are compared to the eternal destiny of men without God. Lord, in case anyone here tonight came in and is now severely shaken at realizing they're facing the judgment, the fury, and the wrath of God suspended over their heads, ready to fall any time, let them come to Jesus tonight. Father, as we pause for even just a minute to let people pray individually and respond personally to your word, I pray that your people tonight will be honest with you and that whatever covenant they make with you, Lord, you enable them to fulfill. Whatever they pray, may your ears be open, Lord. Beloved, will you spend a minute in personal silent prayer to respond to the Lord and what He has laid on your heart tonight? It could be a person. It could be about yourself. But will you just spend a minute before I close this time with the benediction? Let's all pray individually for a minute or so. Father in heaven, whatever your people ask from you or whatever they committed to you, will you assure them that you heard them, Lord? If anyone asked Jesus Christ to be Savior and Lord for the first time tonight, let that person come to us, any of the pastors and elders or ushers or deacons, and just help us follow them up. Lord, whatever commitments or requests Christians made of you tonight, assure them the same way that you heard them. Now let your people depart in peace from this place. Wherever they go, Lord, send them out as missionaries, not of a certain church called GCF. Send them out as your missionaries, your people who will go to wherever they have lived, to go to people they have known and related to and now be unashamed witnesses for you. No matter how faltering our, our words may be, no matter how awkward it may be for us, Lord, enable us to not be ashamed of Jesus, to go to wherever we are and be your missionaries, Lord. This is my prayer for your people. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you all. You go with God.